Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Thank you for logging on and liking us on YouTube and watching, and then on iTunes and Google Play, Facebook, following us at Horse Racing on Twitter. Great to have this person with me. She's one of my favorite people, longtime friend, even though she probably won't admit it. A pioneer in her own right, a trailblazer, even though it's been over 20 years since she has ridden. She is still among the top four in all-time money earning among female jockeys, and you probably know her best with NBC Sports. She is Donna Brothers. Hello, Donna. Hello. Am I not going to admit to being your longtime friend or all the other accolades? Well, maybe the longtime <laughs> friend. I don't know if you want to admit how long we know each other. And you know what I was thinking is I don't know the last time I interviewed you. I guess we interview each other all the time on the on the Triple Crown Trail. What do you think? What do you think? This and that. But an actual that's interview. True. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, yeah. that's true. I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the very first show we ever did together, I'm sure you remember it, but I remember it well because it was my first show, really. It was yeah. the uh, ESPN Jockey Championship out in um, Texas, and you saved me. That's what I remember uh, because you're kind. I kind of got thrown to the wolves on that show. I'd never done a broadcast television show at all. And you just made everything go seamlessly and you would throw me softballs and if I dropped them, you would just pick them up and nobody would even notice. So thank you for that, Kenny. I owe uh, you. You're, you're, God, that was a hundred years ago. You're, you're much too kind. And people ask me all the time, how does Donna do those interviews, those great interviews on horseback right after the race? And I say, because only Donna can do them. I don't know. I certainly would be afraid to even be near a horse, much less trying to ride one with a bunch of great horses that just finished the race. I'd be, they'd throw me, I'd be bumping into people. They'd, ex, they'd, they'd expel me from racetracks everywhere. You know, that's a lot to think about. You're riding, uh, the, the guy you're talking to is, is, you know, out of breath and excited. He's just won the race. There's a lot going on and you've got to be able to, you know, whip out the, one of the 20 jockeys or 18 or however many's in the Derby or one of the big races. Yeah, you know, I will say for me, it's easier to be on the horse than to do a stand-up hit per se. Like, if I'm going to stand there and just do a hit over by the paddock, then I have to wonder about, well, what do I do with the hand that's not holding the microphone? What do I do? Do I stand like this or should I lean against something? And so for me, that part was always, you know, in the beginning, especially to do a stand-up piece, I didn't know what to do with the rest of my body. But if you put me on a horse, my body knew what to do with the rest of my body. <laughs> so <laughs> it diffused any nervous energy that I might have had and help me actually to concentrate more on the, the task at hand, which was a conversation. And, you know, you and Mike Battaglia and Tom Hammond have been my mentors at NBC over the years. And one of the things that you all have impressed upon me is that how important it is to make it a conversation. So it's one thing to have your questions in mind and have a whole direction of the way you think you'd like for it to go. But I really feel like the best interviews come from the ones that turn into uh, something that seems like a conversation someone's overhearing rather than a sort of a staged interview. And, and Kenny, you do that very, very well. But so the, the thing that I do on horseback looks difficult to everybody who has never ridden horses professionally. But since I've rode horses professionally <laughs> for 26 years, it's actually easier <laughs> for me. <laughs> well, you mentioned a key word, and, and that's why, among other Sports Illustrated names, you the sideline reporter of the year about three or four years ago, is there is a conversation afterwards. It, it's not the basic, well, what do you think? How do you like that? What about your ride? I mean, those are kind of the basic things that you don't ask, which makes it always interesting because if I'm with the winner, I'm listening closely to what you're getting from the jockey than things that I can also incorporate with the trainer, perhaps, that I hear or something. And I do the same thing. So sometimes they come to you guys with the trainer first. And so it, it behooves me to listen to what was just said so that I can say, well, Baffert had just told Kenny Rice that he felt like the first half mile fraction might been a, might have been a little quick. What mm -hmm. were you thinking at that point? And so it does help that we, you know, not only listen to the people that we're interviewing, but listen to each other and feed off of each other. But it's a fun gig, Kenny. Right? Oh, oh it is. <laughs> There's nothing like the Derby. And I'll bet right now you're preparing for 20 jockey interviews, aren't you? Because at the way it's shaping up, and I know Santa Anita and, and uh, Bluegrass, Arkansas, big race is still coming up. But after this Florida Derby. I think it's just it just really opens everything up. Maybe Baffert still has the best too. I don't know, but you know when maximum security comes out of the blue, I didn't have him on my radar. I don't think many people did until the Florida Derby. No, as you know, we do this NTRA top ten poll for the uh, top three year old and top thoroughbred yeah. each week, and um, I 
had said right after the race that the part that embarrasses me it's that that horse was so impressive impressive he's gonna have to go in my top 10 and he has never even been on my radar i had never heard of this horse until this week <laughs> and so i went back and looked at the ntra top 10 polls and he had not made like the top 30 of the ntra cut so he wasn't on anybody's radar but the kind of race that he put together yeah you he's a serious contender now yeah, and, and, you know, to me, Donna, I, I think this is a good thing. We've had this string of favorites, and maybe a favorite will do it again this year. Obviously, I wish I knew right now, but who does? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I but I kind of like this. I kind of like this wide openness in some ways. Uh, you never know who's going to pop up. It, you know, maybe maybe we'll have that long shot again. I think it at least is appealing out there to the viewers and those that will be at the track is, do we have that super horse coming in? Do we have a Pharaoh or justify looking one? And maybe we'll have one after the Derb after Santa Anita this weekend with game winner. I don't know that yet, but I, I do like that underdog uh, role that some of these horses may be coming into the Derby with. Yeah. And you know, when you go back and look at the rebel stakes, which I did this morning, um, but both divisions of the rebel stakes, it's easy to see that improbable and game winner. Number one, both got a lot out of the race and number two, probably both needed the race. They broke both broke just a step slow, which I think was an indication or, or just a, a side effect of having been off for so long and not having raced in the last couple months. And so they both broke just a step slow, put them both into positions that they didn't want to be in. Game winner ended up eating more dirt, being shuffled back further than he had before. Improbable ended up being wide around both turns because of his slow break from that outside post. But then if you look at long, long range toddy and Omaha beach, the two horses who beat Baffert's favorites in the rebel stakes, those are real horses too. I mean, Omaha beach ran an amazing race. He's a beautiful, good looking horse trained by Richard Mandela was ridden by Mike Smith. And then long range toddy. If you go back and look at all of his races, he doesn't have a bad race and John right. court wrote an amazing ride, but long range toddy put him in a position to do it. And so, yes, like you, you know, it, it's always easier for us if we can just go, Oh yeah, the, these are the two horses to beat and yeah. that's it. But right now we're pretty deep on who the horses are to beat. I, I think it's going to make for a, for a fun time in it all. And I, I want to ask you because you're so astute and you have an opinion and you're candid. And that's among the many things I like about you is uh, with the whole Santa Anita issue and I don't want to get into about the track and all. We, you know, we've talked that so many times in the, on no, this show. We don't show. have an hour on this show. No, anyway, no, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, and, and <laughs> I, I want to bring in landscapers, soil specialists, you know, it gets into that. <laughs> but one thing that they raised during this that some people have asked me that are casual fans or, or just, you know, they just kind of know me or know somebody we've had on the show and they've tuned in a few times is mm -hmm. about the whips. When they say we're going to limit whip or shall we jockey use whip, then it gets back into a controversy. Uh, that probably needs a little clarifying because some people say, are they beating the horses? What's this whip all about? I think that's the first instinct of those that are on the outside of horse racing. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to back up a little bit to talk about this because when people say do whips hurt, my answer is no, they don't hurt. Horses don't run into pain. I mean, we've learned over the years that horses, if their leg hurts, they slow down. If their tooth hurts because they hit it on the starting gate, they slow down. And if their bum hurts because they're being whipped uh, too vigorously um, or too aggressively, they're going to slow down as well. But I will say we've come a long way. I think there was a time when people used to think that, yeah, if you hit them harder, they'll run faster. Well, we've also learned when we're training our dogs that they learn through positive reinforcement. And we've learned this with the horses too. They learn through positive reinforcement. So over the years, the riding crop has become more and more I don't want to say gentle, but less severe. Let's say that it's become less severe. And so that it does make a loud popping noise, but it's really more just to startle them than it is to to hurt them. And also keep in mind that they, they are very thick skinned. So, you know, we brand a cow unsedated and their right. skin is about the same as a cow's. And so in order to be able to, to hurt a horse, you know, with, with a strike like that, it would take somebody who probably weighs a bit more than the 100 pounds that the jockeys weigh in, in some sort of a riding crop that would be a bit more severe. And again, our riding crops did used to be a bit more severe than they are now. But we've learned over the years, we have now what we call the cushion crop. Mm -hmm. And so it's got a actually padded popper. That's the end part of the, uh, the riding crop that actually hits the horse. And while it does make a loud poppy noise, it doesn't hurt them. And I, I actually like to compare it to a personal fitness trainer. And so if you're at the gym and you're working out and you're training hard for 
any sort of a competition that you have coming up and you have your personal fitness trainer there and you know, you're getting to your max reps, they're there going, come on, you can do this. You've got this, you've got it. (laughs) And really that's what the jockey is doing with the riding crop. They're like, come on, buddy, pay attention. No, don't drift out that way. And so they might hit them a couple of times on the right side. And then if they go to drift in, switch the crop over to their left hand. No, not that way either. Go straight. (laughs) Come on, you've got this. I'm right here with you. I'm tired too, but I'm still trying. So this is sort of, this is what the jockey is doing. And again, if the riding crop hurt them, they wouldn't be running faster. They'd been slowing. They'd be slowing down. That is the best explanation I've heard. And and (laughs) seriously, and thank you because you know, uh, look, I know they got a lot of problems out there, but I thought they really muddied the water with the press release about the whips and the medication. And then, because now you've got people that are coming in from the Washington Post and New York Times that don't cover horse racing. And mm-hmm. they should talk to you just what you said about the whip, because otherwise mm-hmm. they're saying they're whipping horses. What's this? You know how it goes. You, you've been around enough. You know that there's a there's a segment out there that are hoping to find something bad about the sport. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I and I get it too. By the way, I mean, a kid comes to the races and and loves the horses, and then all of a sudden sees the jockey striking the horse with the the riding crop, and I could see why the first thing they would say is, "Does that hurt?" But it's the same way if you're out with your dog and your dog is on a leash, and all of a sudden your dog goes to chase after a squirrel, and that's not allowed, and you yank back on that training collar, reminding your dog of expected behavior. Now, we keep our dogs on leashes because we want to make sure that they stay between the fences, so to speak, and don't (laughs) chase squirrels and run in front of cars. And so I feel like there's a certain safety standard that is met with carrying the riding crop because horses, they're just like young kids or like your dog outside on a leash. They're easily distracted. And so to take away the riding crop would be like saying, okay, I'll tell you what, you can take your kids to the amusement park and you can be there all day long and you can go for free, <laughs> but you're not allowed to discipline your kids the whole time you're there. Right. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to buy into that. They're, not at all. No, no, thank you. <laughs> and here's the other thing, you know, people say, we're making these horses run like uh, human athletes going to make the choice of whether they're going to run or not, but the horses don't. Well, that's wrong because I've ridden long enough. And right. uh, as you know, my husband trained to know that we actually do get thoroughbreds into the barn who don't want to run. And guess what? We don't race them because it's impossible to make a horse who doesn't want to run run. In fact, you would have better luck getting a three-year-old kid to run in a race you didn't want to run in because at least you could maybe take away, you know, well, you're not going to get dessert for the next month and you're not going to get to play with any of your toys, so you could persuade them. But if you had a three-year-old colt who didn't want to load in the starting gate and run the race, good luck making that happen. <laughs> well put, exactly the way exactly the way it is out there. Of course, Donna's husband, Frankie Brothers, great horseman, one of the, one of the true gentlemen in the business. And the next time you're on... I want you to be on with, I want to talk about you and your mom and and maybe get everybody, you guys on because um, Julie Crone was on a couple of shows ago and just spoke highly of you and your mom, Patty, and and just about the trailblazing that all of you did and how, you know, one thing led to another to another to to get to the sport now where you don't go, wow, there's a a female jockey. I didn't know they still had female (laughs) jockeys, you know, and it's your time. And certainly when your mom was riding, it's like this, it was such a, it was a novelty. And, uh, and I think that that's come a long way and you're a big part of that. Well, and one of the reasons why there's so much talk about it this year, and thank you for that, but it's the 50 year anniversary of the, uh, 1969 was the first year that women were actually, um, uh, Kathleen, Kathy Kustner got the license in 1968 and the right to ride, but nobody rode in their first race until 1969. And so this is the 50 year anniversary of, of that having happened. And so on April 20th, my mom, my sister, and a bunch of our friends, and um, yeah, quite a few of us, I think like 20 of us are going to spend the day at Keeneland, really just there to recognize my mother's, you know, huge accomplishment. I mean, 50 years ago, oh, yeah. maybe not on that day, but certainly in that it was in the spring of 1969 that she rode in her first races and she won her first race in May um, at a recognized racetrack. And, and Keeneland's even going to um, have mom do a trophy presentation for one of the races, which oh, is really nice. That That is nice. And if you have a chance, go by and say hello to her and to say hello to Donna too, if you're in the Lexington, Kentucky area that day, because I think that's, yeah, that's, that's well-deserved. And, yeah, and yeah, Donna's very really friendly, by the way. She's a TV star with NBC, <laughs> but she will talk to you. I've, I've seen her do that. Unlike Kenny Rice, who just puts his nose in the air when people walk up. <laughs> you know, I'm just kidding. You know what? You might get this. I get this every year at the Derby. I mean, I'm telling you, every year. 
some people even I don't know, and every now and then a few friends will say, saw you at the Derby. I said, hello, you didn't speak to me. I go, well, you know, I had like 30 seconds to go talk to Baffert or 25 seconds to talk to this guy or get someplace. And I'll bet it's that way with you. You're riding out there on your horse. And everybody think, oh, there's Donna riding on her horse. Hey, Donna, Donna, I'm over here. Look at me. You yes. know, they don't know you've, well, got, the, you've got less than a minute to get in position before the race starts. Not just that. On the big days like Derby and, and Breeders' Cup, and uh, if, it, if we have a Triple Crown on the line, I'll use a double earpiece. So I'll oh, actually yeah. have the show in both ears because the crowd noise sometimes when you're out there on the horse can be so loud. Right. And I just really need to block all that noise and just hear the show. And so I really just literally cannot hear them saying hello to me because all I hear is program. <laughs> and so then finally they'll like, you know, like really, really, really wave me down and I might see them and then I'll, I'll give them a, a quick glance or a quick wave. And yes, I think sometimes they think that we're being impolite, but really it's just that, um, well, we don't go visit them when they are in the middle of surgery on any patients <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, when they're in the middle of trying a case in front of the lawyer, I mean, in front of the judge. So <laughs> Maybe we should. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should. <laughs> maybe that'll maybe work. Get it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Don, I know you got to run. Listen, I always appreciate your time and I will see you soon. We have a few things coming up, a three day event. And of course, the Triple Crown on NBC that we work together. And I always love to see you. You know that. Yep, and it's always fun, Kenny, and it's always good to talk to you. And by the way, I've really enjoyed your show. I've, I've listened to or watched many of the episodes, not all of them yet, because you've got so many. You've been prolific, but I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Donna Brothers, what a wonderful person she is and a great broadcaster with NBC. Of course, you'll see her all over the place on the Triple Crown scene. And we'll be back with more of the Horse Racing Show right after this.